that, we got interrupted on chapter 23, so there will be two videos for chapter 23. Um, so, we talked about our ions, we're moving on to slide 7 with our picture of our um, phases um, and our action potential. So, antiarrhythmic drugs that slow phase 0, prolong phases 1 through 3, or decrease phase 4 automaticity produce effective antiarrhythmic actions. And that phase that you see there is the buildup of ions and then the action potential that cascades down. Okay, so the therapeutic effects of antiarrhythmic drugs rest in their ability to affect the electro electrophysiologic properties um, of the cardiac membrane and the movement of ions so that the properties of the heart are restored to normal or at least improved. One cautionary note that I want to mention is that any antiarrhythmic drug has the potential to make any existing arrhythmia worse. So when we talk about phases on that chart on page seven on that graph, depolarization is phase zero, and then everything after that is that cascade down where phase one um, is phase one to two, and two into three is where calcium is involved. That's the contraction of the cardiac muscle. Repolarization, where the ions come back in, um, potassium, is involved in that. So keep that in mind when we talk about the drugs and how they affect the action potential. Okay, so antiarrhythmic drugs are classified according to the Vaughn Williams classification system. Um, they are organized into four major classes based on major mechanism of action. Um, I think one thing I didn't cover that we will, you'll hear over um, on the previous slide, it was torsades de points, which is a proarrhythmia um, that is often seen before a fatal arrhythmia. Anytime you hear the word torsades, you want to be a little nervous because this is an arrhythmia that could lead to sudden death or cardiac arrest. Torsades de points um, is actually a side effect of some drugs or a side effect of the interaction of a, of a couple drugs. Okay, so that's QT prolongation. So when we have the beat on the ECG, there's a part of it that's prolonged, and if it's the Q to T interval, that's called QT prolongation or torsades de points. So on slide nine, we have all of our um, class one through four drugs, and right next to the class is the mechanism of action. So you can see class one blocks um, sodium channels, class two blocks beta adrenergic receptors. Class 3 blocks potassium channels, and class 4 blocks calcium channels. There's examples of each of them um, on the far right, as well as main effects in the middle there. So let's start off with class 1, our sodium channel blockers. Class 1 antiarrhythmic drugs possess local anesthetic activity. They block the influx of sodium ions during depolarization and suppress arrhythmias in cardiac cells that are hyperexcitable, just waiting to sort of pop off and cause a contraction. So <clears throat> the class 1 drugs are divided into three subgroups, 1A, 1B, and 1C, based on the degree to which they block sodium ions during depolarization, which is phase 0. 1As are moderate, 1B is mild, and 1C is pretty intense, or as they say, marked, but pretty intense works as well. 1A includes quinidine, procainamide, and disopyramide. In the past, quinidine has been used to treat supraventricular arrhythmias such as atrial flutter um, and fibrillation, and also ventricular arrhythmias. However, quinidine is a cardiac depressant that decreases myocardial contraction. In addition, quinidine produces anticholinergic and alpha-blocking effects, so it can cause a wide range of adverse effects and potential toxicities. Therefore, it's not very often used. Um, a synthetic drug related to procaine, called procainamide, um, has similar antiarrhythmic actions to quinidine. However, procainamide produces less anticholinergic and alpha-blocking actions than quinidine, therefore fewer adverse effects and toxicities. It is the most frequently used 1A antiarrhythmic drug. And keep in mind, these are moderate sodium channel blockers, I think. Um, and it's effective for both supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias. However, it is primarily indicated for outpatient treatment. The actions of disopyramide or norpace on the heart are similar to quinidine and procainamide. Um, it causes a decrease in conduction and prolongation of the refractory period. That gives the heart more time to gather itself back together before the next contraction, so it is in tune with itself when it contracts. It's not 
fluttering or fibrillating, okay? This drug, um, the last one, disulfiramide, is only approved for treating ventricular arrhythmias. Moving on to our 1Bs and our 1Cs. Um, 1B includes lidocaine and mexilatine. A synthetic drug um, used primarily as a local anesthetic, lidocaine is widely used for ventricular arrhythmias, especially those resulting from a myocardial infarction or arrhythmias occurring during surgery. As a rule, lidocaine is ineffective in atrial arrhythmias and therefore not recommended for use in these conditions. The main effect of lidocaine prevention of ventricular arrhythmias is attributed to its ability to depress automaticity. So remember we said um, generally that that um, sorry, something on my computer was going wrong. I thought I'd lost you guys. Remember we said generally that the ventricles aren't autom don't have automaticity. However, in cases of ischemia and other arrhythmias, they do. So lidocaine is used to suppress that automaticity. Maxillotine is a derivative of lidocaine and has been structurally modified so that it can be administered orally. It produces cardiac effects similar to lidocaine and is used for treatment of outpatient. 1C, flecainide and propafenone. Remember, these are marked or intense um, block of sodium ions. Flecainide and propafenone are drugs that are used, um, they're usually reserved for the treatment of arrhythmias that are unresponsive to other antiarrhythmic drugs. They markedly depress cardiac conduction and they're usually indicated for supraventricular arrhythmias, so atrial arrhythmias. Adverse effects include GI disturbances, bradycardia, heart block, and the potential for heart failure. You can see a lot of things start going wrong once we start having arrhythmias occurring within the heart. So, class two beta blockers, um, class two antiarrhythmics, which are our beta blockers. The beta adrenergic blockers um, antagonize the effects of norepinephrine and epinephrine, so they decrease heart rate, AV conduction, and automaticity of the SA and AV nodes and atrial and ventricular muscle. Beta blockers are mainly indicated for supraventricular arrhythmias and for prevention of recurrent myocardial infarction. Most commonly used in antiarrhythmia is propranolol, acebutalol, and esmolol. The most common, uh, most common side effects um, are hypotension and bradycardia. In addition, or in overdosage, propranolol and other beta blockers may cause heart failure and cardiac arrest, so we have to be careful with our dosing. Esmolol is a selective beta blocker that only acts on the heart and it's administered by intravenous infusion in emergency situations when ra rapid beta blockade is desired to lower heart rate. So with this drug, again, um, very sensitive, overdose can lead to excessive bradycardi bradycardia, delayed AV conduction, and hypotension. <clears throat> Class three, potassium channel blockers. The main antiarrhythmic action of potassium channel blockers um, is to interfere with the e efflux or the leaving of potassium ions during repolarization phases one through three. This action prolongs the refractory period of the heart and decreases the frequency of arrhythmias. Amiodarone is sort of our class standard here. It has multiple sites of action. In addition to blocking potassium channels, amiodarone blocks sodium um, and calcium channels. It also has blocking actions on both beta and alpha adrenergic receptors, so it's pretty much an all-around antiarrhythmic. It can be used for supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias. Sotolol is a non-selective beta blocker that also has class three antiarrhythmic activity, usually used for ventricular arrhythmias and atrial fibrillation. Dofetilide and ibutilide are two class three drugs whose actions are limited to blocking potassium channels. Dofetilide is indicated for the treatment of atrial fibrillation, whereas ibutilide is used for conversion um, of atrial flutter and AFib to normal sinus rhythm. Last but not least, class four calcium channel blockers. These drugs decrease the entry of calcium into cells whose electrophysiological action depend on the influx of calcium through slow type calcium channels, otherwise heart muscle. The effect of calcium channel blockers on the assay node is to slow the depolarization and decrease the heart rate. The effect on AV node is to slow conduction. These actions reduce the ventricular rate during, during fast supraventricular arrhythmias. Calcium channel blockers also affect the contraction of cardiac and smooth muscle. Interference with calcium entry into cardiac muscle reduces myocardial contractility. This is usually not a desired therapeutic action and may precipitate heart failure in patients with CHF. While all calcium channel blockers produce vasodilation, only verapamil and diltiazem have direct action on the heart and are used for antiarrhythmic actions. So 
that may sound a little confusing to you because last chapter we talked about um, calcium channel blockers. I'm sorry, in the next chapter we'll talk about calcium channel blockers being used for chest pain. Um, so just keep in mind, just because it helps with one thing might mean that it has side effects that hurt another thing, okay? Common calcium channel blockers include, we talked about verapamil and diltiazem, adenosine is another one, um, and there's a little coverage on adenosine that we want to talk about. Um, common adverse effects of verapamil include headache, dizziness, and minor GI disturbances, especially constipation. Vasodilating effects can produce hypotension, especially when patients change position. Um, the cardio, cardiac depressant effects of diltiazem are slightly less than that of verapamil, but diltiazem is generally considered to be a more potent vasodilator than verapamil. So adenosine is considered a miscellaneous antiarrhythmic drug that is used only in emergency and diagnostic acute situations. It is the naturally occurring metabolite of adenosine triphosphate, and it's administered intravenously to terminate episodes of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Adverse effects are brief, but include asystole, which means no rhythm at all, flatline, respiratory difficulties, and hypotension. Special considerations for the uh, antiarrhythmics. The control of arrhythmias can be difficult. Antiarrhythmic drugs are frequently administered by IV infusion. Most antiarrhythmic drugs are cardiac depressants that can do, produce heart failure and new cardiac arrhythmias. Okay. Preferred therapy. To stabilize and pro protect the ventricles, we have um, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers as well as digoxin. For chronic therapy of arrhythmias, the same exact three things. Um, let's see, we talked about adenosine. If there's increased sympathetic tone, we're going to use our beta blockers. Ventricular tachycardia, we use amiodarone and lidocaine. And ventricular arrhythmias and tachycardia, we can also use beta blockers in addition to amiodarone. So that covers chapter 23, and we'll move on. Remember, this one has two sections because I got cut off in the middle of it. Um, we'll move on to 24 in the next one.